All right, today will be my first time using Screencastify. I hope it goes well. There's going to be a couple bumps, I'm sure, in the road. I'll be speaking today from a, a slideshow called Networks of Exchange, and it's just a variety of different maps that I, I kind of put together. So I will be talking with my mouse. This will be not a traditional PowerPoint where I have bullets flying up. Um, I will be posting this PDF online for my students so they could annotate it along the way. Uh, we'll be covering kind of as a whole unit two. And uh, let's get started. All right. First of all, you'll see that I have the Freemanpedia visual up here. Now, by the time we get to the 1500s, this entire uh, network will be open, you know, the triangular trade. But as of 1200 to 1450, it's not. And we are still with uh, the Trans-Saharan trade, the Mediterranean Sea trade, the Silk Road land-based trade, and the Indian Ocean trade. So we're going to talk about each one of these for a few minutes. So let's start with the Silk Road. I think the Silk Road, it, you know, may be the easiest to know because you've heard of it for so long. Um, the Silk Road goes all the way back to the Roman era where they were trading with the Han Chinese. And really, the Silk Road is still around today. China is still in development of a, a highway that is hopefully going to connect them to what would be more of the Eastern Europe and Western Asia here to create a kind of a new modern day Silk Road. So first of all, by the name Silk Road, we know that one luxury good that went along the Silk Road was silk. Silk coming from China because of uh, what of a silkworm. But I mean, another finished good that was a luxury item was porcelain. But also coming along the Silk Road were not luxury goods, but luxury spices, such as pepper, um, nutmeg, and cinnamon. You have to remember that thing I told you about, that one pound of pepper used to be worth more than one pound of gold. Um, that was because it was in demand over here in Roman and, uh, you know, during the development of Europe. Now, coming from Europe, there were some goods being brought, but also money was being brought, um, anything from the gold of West Africa or eventually the silver of the Potosi mines in the Americas. Now, besides those finished goods being traded, um, a couple other elements. A lot of the countries or empires that are going to be developed here will be developed along the, the Silk Road. Samarkand is possibly one of the most famous in Kashgar. So I wouldn't be surprised if on an AP test you have a document that references uh, some merchant in Samarkand or a merchant in Kashgar. And when we put uh, Genghis Khan on trial, we had somebody who died in the city of Balkh because of uh, Genghis Khan overrunning them. So don't be surprised when you see things like that that are emerging on a document on, a, on an AP test. Um, now, why would these cities be emerging? Well, they're emerging as merchant network cities. Um, they only exist because of the trade that existed. Um, they will have more than one language being spoken, and sometimes the language was that of money. Uh, a good example was that the Chinese, who did develop paper money, also developed the concept of uh, flying money. This idea that somebody can put money in a bank over here, bring a piece of paper with them to Samarkand, and go to a bank there and withdraw it like a, you know, 13th century ATM machine. This idea is high order thinking when it comes to banking. This idea that you don't actually have to have coins in your pocket, that you could actually go somewhere and get money that you had deposited somewhere else. And that is another reason why trade thrives on the Silk Road is because money was accessible. Now, besides flying money, I think something else is important to understand is that a lot of the 12 and 1300s were uh, solidified along the Silk Road because of Pax Mongolica. 
Now, any historian will talk about the peace of Rome, Pax Romana, uh, because of the peace and stability that the Romans developed. What has happened is we've applied that term here. Now, the way that the Mongols created peace was by viciousness. If you were a merchant, you were almost guaranteed you will be able to travel on the Silk Road lest the, the Mongols will do something. But with that being said, they created a certain amount of stability that allowed trade to thrive. So we see an interconnectedness amongst Europe and Western Asia with all the way over to East Asia during Pax Mongolica, the peace of the Mongols. Um, so I talked about some cities, I talked about trade, some items. Um, I guess the other idea that we need to talk about is what else went along the Silk Road besides items and money. Um, I guess I would like to start with uh, religion. Religion, for example, the Mongols, as they conquered, they didn't enforce any certain religion on the people. And in that way, we always reference uh, the Mongols as being religiously tolerant. But that doesn't mean they didn't spread religion. Uh, Buddhism was spread by the Mongols, but most famously, Islam was spread by the Mongols. I'll give an example. As the Mongols were getting closer and closer and closer to Western Asia, many of them were finding Islam and converting. So by the time the Mongols destroy Baghdad, which would be right here, they sack Baghdad, they destroy Baghdad, they were already Muslim. So they were Muslims attacking Muslims, not for religious, but for territorial conquest. But I think that says something powerful, both about how easy it was for Islam to be adapted by foreign people, but also by the power of um, the Mongols as they spread west to spread both religion and ideas like that. Something else that was spreading along the Silk Road were the ideas, such as the ideas or technology of gunpowder, printing money with a printing press, paper money. So a lot of the ideas that will make Europe very powerful and the gunpowder empires very powerful eventually started over in East Asia. And because of right now what we're going through in America, um, with our quarantine, it is obviously important for us to talk about that. It's also on this, we see the travel of disease. And the disease of the bubonic plague, the Black Death, did eventually spread all the way to Western Europe. And it decimated Western Europe because Western Europe had the least contact with such a deadly um, disease. And uh, eventually it gets into the Mediterranean, it gets into Venice, and actually it's amazing to watch the Black Death or the bubonic plague spread month to month or year to year throughout Europe, but it did come from East Asia. Mm, pretty good, pretty good. That's the Silk Road. So let's go down. Now we have, oh, there was a famous traveler on the Silk Road, uh, Marco. Did you do it? Let's do it again. Marco, did you do it? No, you didn't do it. I don't care. So there's Marco Polo. Um, Marco Polo did travel with family to um, to the Yuan Dynasty, to the, the, the Mongol Dynasty while in China, um, meeting Kublai Khan, and for part of his life, sitting on Kublai Khan's court. And then Marco Polo, um, besides a traveler, was a merchant. But what he did was eventually write a book about his adventures. And um, if you will, he probably would say, I would say he glorified what he saw in East Asia by making it sound different and mystical and uh, a place where people want to be connected. Um, his name became very powerful in Europe as that traveler. Um, and obviously making people want to find land and sea routes 
to, to Asia. So Marco Polo um, was not a conqueror, but if anything, he spread knowledge about East Asia, even though he might have sounded, made it sound a little bit better than it was. Um, they still had poverty, death, and disease. So I wanted to bring that up. I apologize. Uh, all right, let's drop down to the Indian Ocean trade. So Indian Ocean trade is awesome. That's why John Green makes an episode on it. Um, great episode if you want to watch that. Heimler, of course, as well. So the Indian Ocean trade um, connects, you know, all of these different very foreign lands. Over here we have a. Uh, East Africa and the very much city-state nature of Great Zimbabwe, uh, the Swahili coast, goes up and takes uh, the Islamic merchants here along the Horn of Africa and, of course, Arabia, connects it to the Hindus of India and eventually the Buddhists of Southeast Asia and the Hindus of Southeast Asia. Wow. But then, of course, one thing that happened was that it was Muslim merchants traveling a lot, a lot, using um, one of their one of their um, the, the Latin sail, for example, right? Um, traveling along the monsoons. So what we start to see is Muslim diasporic or diaspora. So there's Muslim cities emerging. Merchants are living there. And of course, um, especially because of their faith, they're spreading uh, the Arabic language, the language of the Quran. Um, so if you wanted to be a trader here along the Indian Ocean Trade Network, you're going to need to learn Arabic, the language both spoken and written. And, and wouldn't it just be convenient that you're learning this that you might even maybe convert? So that's why I always shared the fact that Today, the number one most populated Islamic nation, definitely not over here in the Middle East, it used to be India, but today it's Indonesia. And then number two is India. So what's powerful is that if you follow the arc of the Indian Ocean Trade Network, you follow the arc of the Islamic world, Dar al-Islam. Dar al-Islam is not just a land-based uh, region, it is, it traveled by sea. Now, yes, uh, along this way, we're gonna see goods uh, and spices being traveling. You're gonna see uh, the gold and sadly slaves of East Africa spreading. You're going to see that people made money by traveling by season. I don't want to go over too much on the monsoons. We, we beat that uh, in class. But the monsoons would have the wet monsoon, which pushed winds over like India, causing lots of flooding. But then you have the dry monsoons, the winter monsoons, bringing you back. So it's not that merchants traveled. Um, sometimes... They traveled not at their own whim, but at the whim of nature, which got them stuck in places for weeks or months. And that's why you see those Muslim diaspora communities is because you didn't just go to a place, trade and leave. You stayed there for a while. Um, okay, so we talked about this character. His name is Ibn Battuta. Uh, we weren't able to watch his video in class. I posted his video, that song about Ibn Battuta. So Ibn Battuta, though, is Mali. He did travel by the Silk Road for part of his life. He's also famous for traveling along the Indian Ocean Trade Network. Ibn Battuta was able to find homes along this region very easily because of Islamic background and the Arabic faith. So he's a good example of yet another global traveler. Hmm. I think this is a powerful visual. Like right here, we have the Strait of Malacca. The Strait of Malacca that goes right here. This is going to be powerful even during, you know, the era of uh, the European explorations. This is going to still be where what the Dutch want to hold and eventually the Portuguese are going to want this. Um, the Strait of Malacca was a, a shortcut, if you will, 
a water passage here. But to get through the Strait of Malacca, you had to make sure that you went there with peace. You didn't want somebody attacking you, almost like a pirate uh, demanding some sort of a tax or a tariff for your travels. All right. The Indian Ocean Trade Network. I don't want you to think it's too different than the Silk Road. There's more similarities than differences. This is our old friend, the Mediterranean trade. Um, good. I, I'm always texting with students during these days to make sure everybody's alive. Um, this is the Mediterranean. It's so old, right? Um, I've always used in class that I refer to Constantinople and eventually Istanbul as the hub. I mean, this is the hub where the Indian Ocean trade comes in here. You have the Silk Road coming in here. And obviously, for a while during the Byzantine era, the only strong, stable power in Europe was going to be that of um, Eastern Europe, the Byzantine Empire, and the city of Constantinople. Now, briefly, um, we're going to see that the gold, the ivory, and the slaves coming from the Trans Saharan trade network coming up. We're going to see. Um, those goods being exploited around here. But then the new route I want to bring up is right here. We talked about in class how the Kievan Rus eventually led to the development of Russia. And the reason why I want to bring this up just once again is we have Viking traders trading down here with Constantinople. So we're going to have some trade routes emerging. Um, the people of the Kievan Rus and the Moscovite princes have to make a decision. Who are they? What are they? And many of them are going to make that uh, choice to be Russian Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox Christians. And they eventually learn the Cyrillic language, uh, a language created by um, monks coming out of Constantinople. But what solidifies the actual power of the Boscovite princes is what was coming along the Silk Road, and that was your Mongol conquest. So trade here, religion here, but what was happening is a lot of the religious and economic centers emerged in Moscow. Kievan Rus was destroyed by the Mongols. So now in Moscow, you see the church heads there for safety. And then the Moscovite princes, which is kind of like a powerful city-state, started collecting the tribute of all the different uh, Russian principalities. And they would take all that tribute and give it to the Golden Horde, give it to the Mongols, keeping them at bay. So Moscow was never conquered by the Golden Horde. They paid them off with tribute. So they never become Islamic. They never fall to the, the Mongol. They never did that because of the power they had. And I contend that a lot of that power, a lot of that influence, a lot of that centralization came from Constantinople and being part of that Mediterranean trade. What else do you want to say here? So we got... Trade network, trade network, trade network. Um, now, notice there's a lot of unique items such as wool up here. The reason why I want to bring that up is that what were the Europeans developing in this time? And one thing they developed was the Hanseatic League. The Hanseatic League was made up of a bunch of nations or cities and powers up here who wanted to start to solidify trade along both the Mediterranean and Northern European. They were kind of like a monopoly, if you will. They worked in cohort with each other to make sure that trade was stable, unified, and orderly, the Hanseatic League. Um, I'm pretty good, and I think I have one more. Yay! Okay, last one. So for this one, I've chosen this visual because it has both Western Africa, and then Eastern Africa. So let's remember that the Bantu language eventually spreads down here 
And when it spreads down here, the Bantu language emerges into what you and I would recognize as Swahili, many dialects of Swahili. Um, knowledge about iron spreads, but what does not develop here are nations or empires. Mostly they are city-states. They traded with each other, sometimes undermining each other, traded against each other. So that's Eastern Africa. Over here in Western Africa, we have the Kingdom of Ghana, eventually replaced by Mali, eventually replaced by the Songhai. If you want to say it like major power replaced by majors, it's not like everybody from Ghana was destroyed. There were still Ghananese. Now, right here, you'll see the Mali Empire, the largest of the three empires. And one of its central locations was the city of Timbuktu. All right. So the Mali, they traded in gold, uh, especially up towards the north and with the Europeans. The Mali were largely Islamic. Um, one of the most famous Mali leaders was uh, Mansa Musa. Um, besides being Islamic, he was a devout Muslim who chose to go on his Hajj. So as he goes on his pilgrimage to Mecca, he's going to go along the Trans-Saharan route, spreading knowledge about the Mali, but also spreading his wealth. And of course, even John Green alludes to the fact he spread, he had such a large caravan of people with him and he had a spending spree along the way of gold. He started creating inflation and hyperinflation along the way as people started raising their prices to get the most out of Mansa Musa's pilgrimage to Hajj, his uh, pilgrimage to Mecca, Medina. Now, the city of Timbuktu, one thing I love about the city of uh, Timbuktu is if you remember some of the visuals, there, there are libraries and there, they have mosques and they look very, very Muslim and ornate in the sense that they look like a mosque, obviously, sorry. But at the same time, they were built out of sand. So it's like you adapt to your nature, but you still see the infiltration of Islam coming in. Uh, a spreading of a faith. So the Mongols spread it. The It spreads all the way down to uh, Western Africa, Sub-Sahara Africa, very powerful. And it's a big religion along the Indian Ocean trade. So in some ways, I feel Unit 2 should be called like the expansion of Islam unit, because though it wasn't a central part of it, it just kept happening no matter where we went. Now, yes, it did not spread into Christian Dome Europe, but that's because of the Battle of Tours and the successful ability of the Europeans to be united in something, and they chose to be united in uh, the Roman Catholic Church. That was a side note there. Um, so from the Mali was Ibn Battuta, a traveler, Mansa Musa, a traveler. Um, obviously from Venice, we're going to have Marco Polo. So these are three of the great travelers of Unit 2. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised if one of their documents is put on the AP test. Now, all of these routes, if you really think about it, they had to have stops along the way, the caravansiers. Um, where people stopped and they brought their ideas. And a lot of toleration did emerge, especially along the Silk Road and the Indian Ocean trade network. I contend there were times, though, where the Abbasid Empire had such a stronghold in North Africa that it was, if you remember the Jizya, it was probably to be more stable if you joined the Islamic faith. And of course, the Abbasids that controlled everything from Baghdad all the way up here to Cordoba and Al Andalus. Remember, the Iberian Peninsula at one time was Islamic, um, becomes part of the Islamic world. And the reason why I'm digressing is, you know, right here, you're going to see part of the Islamic world. Right here is part of the Islamic world. Right here. And of course, right here. So, it's like on every single map, you have part of Dar al-Islam. 
that is not like any other thing. You don't see Christian dome, the Hindus on every single one of these maps, but you do see Dar al Islam, the, the house of wisdom, house of uh, Islam. Now, one of the great downfalls is right here that the Mali kingdoms will eventually be conquered by the Songhai. And the Songhai will open up relations in the Atlantic trade network, leading to the downfall of great powers in Western Africa as the uh, African slave trade begins, the Middle Passage, triangular trade. It's very, very sad. Um, all right. So there's my little spiel. I hope you have a good one and uh, take care.